on a cold Russian morning, Modest Tchaikovsky, Alexander Glazunov, and Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov gathered inside Modest's St. Petersburg flat, grappling with a stunning conclusion. Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, Russia's greatest artistic son, was dead. But who was to blame? Who had the motivation to do this? The suspects. Tsar Alexander III. Though he thought of Tchaikovsky as one of Russia's greatest sons, Tchaikovsky's personal proclivities, specifically his homosexuality, made the Tsar wary. Had Tchaikovsky somehow transgressed across a line and enraged the Tsar? Count Fenbach Sturmor, a fellow member of the Russian aristocracy. Rumors had swirled Tchaikovsky had an eye for his nephew, but were they true? Could this have caused the Count to do something unthinkable? Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky himself. While Tchaikovsky was a favored son in Russia, his path to glory had not been an easy one, and he had suffered many bouts of emotional trauma. But did his time on Earth come to an end by his own hand? And that's the question. Who was really responsible for the mysterious death of Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky? After his last rites had been read to him and a group of his closest friends, family, associates, admirers, and lovers had processed through the streets of St. Petersburg on a cold Russian morning to lay him to rest for the final time at Alexander Nevsky Monastery, the elite of Russia began to whisper, What happened? Officially, the doctor summoned in Tchaikovsky's final moments had declared a diagnosis of cholera based on the description of Tchaikovsky's symptoms, but this seemed to run against all common sense in multiple ways and did not suffice as a realistic answer to those who were his last witnesses. That Tchaikovsky, the most famous Russian composer of his day, could be struck down at age 53 with a poor man's disease such as cholera sent a shockwave through Russian society. To many, it seemed almost inexplicable that he was felled by a disease that again was considered a burden of the lower and impoverished classes of St. Petersburg. Nonetheless, the doctor's report from the night of his demise and the official coroner's note confirmed that, yes, cholera had been the culprit. But as time went on and weeks passed by, this vague skepticism from the Russian and international elite turned from mild disbelief to outright denial and a demand, in some corners, for the real answers of what happened during the last week of Pyotr Ilyich's life. And it is this question that we will investigate here today. At the time of his death, there was no disputing that Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky was one of the most famous composers in all of Europe, let alone Russia itself. He had slowly and meticulously built himself up in the West from peculiar Russian oddity to a titan of a new style of classical music, Russian Romanticism. And at home in Russia, while initially viewed by some, including the notorious Kuchka, as a musical traitor to the West, by the time of the premiere of his Sixth Symphony, he was lauded as the pinnacle fusionist composer, deftly managing the raw folk melodies of his Russian homeland with the complex, sinewy structures of Western Europe's established compositional forms. It had been a long journey for Pyotr Ilyich, starting in a family of wealthy Russian aristocrats with Ukrainian Cossack roots, being prodded by his father into the imperial school of jurisprudence with the intention of a job in the civil service, to abandoning that and fully dedicating himself to the craft of music, while enduring harsh and biting criticism from tutors and musical titans such as Anton Rubinstein. And finally, securing a teaching post at the newly created Moscow Conservatory and being acknowledged as the greatest composer in Russia by the general public and the elite. By the 1880s, Tchaikovsky was at the peak of his powers, beloved both at home and in the West as an icon of Russian music. However, despite this triumphant outward-facing appearance, things were not exactly well in Tchaikovsky's personal life. Despite his best attempts to hide, avoid, and deny it, Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky was gay. His first and only marriage to one Antonina Milyukova in 1877 ended in disaster after a mere two months when it became clear 
that his physical desires definitively lay elsewhere. However, there is a part of this story that, while known to his close associates, family, and friends, was unknown to the general public at the time. Flooded with despair at the nature of his sexuality and realizing, like so many gay men before him, that his desires were not wont to change, Tchaikovsky, in despondency, stole himself away one night to the river Neva, at first with the intention to drown himself. However, wanting to avoid the stigma of self-deletion, he then decided to simply wade in long enough to give himself pneumonia that could then go untreated and his death could be explained away naturally. Thankfully for humanity and the world of music, this effort failed. And shortly thereafter, Modest Tchaikovsky, who himself was also gay, comforted his brother and sent him on a trip around continental Europe that reinvigorated his spirits. Now, despite this apparent epiphany and then subsequent self-acceptance, Tchaikovsky would continue to go through peaks and valleys throughout his life about how he viewed his sexuality, sometimes reveling in the joy of being gay and using it to fuel some of his greatest compositions, Sleeping Beauty, Swan Lake, and the aforementioned Sixth Symphony, other times being consumed by a self-hatred so dense that he would be stricken with depression for long stretches. Now, despite all this, from the moment his marriage to Antonina Milyukova ended, Tchaikovsky was able to move on with his life and entered his most fruitful and creative period despite the aforementioned challenges. That is, however, until that fateful week in 1893. Now, in order to fully examine the details and inconsistencies surrounding Tchaikovsky's death, we need to establish a full timeline of events that led up to his untimely demise, specifically the week of October 28th to November 7th, 1893. On October 28th, Tchaikovsky debuted perhaps the greatest work of his career, the Sixth Symphony, with the composer as the conductor. Then, subsequently on November 1st, after seeing Alexander Ostrovsky's The Ardent Heart, Tchaikovsky, Modest, Vladimir Bob Davidov, his nephew, and composer Alexander Glazanov took in a meal at the legendary St. Petersburg restaurant, the Literary Café. It was at this dinner, according to Modest, that Tchaikovsky inexplicably decided to drink a glass of unboiled water with dinner despite warnings from the city and the restaurant itself that water needed to be boiled as there was an ongoing cholera epidemic at the time. The following days, from November 1st to November 5th, Tchaikovsky suddenly declined in health, afflicted evermore by increasing gastrointestinal symptoms until on November 6th, Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky passed into the internal night forever. However, there is one pernicious detail of the last week of his life. The dates of October 30th to October 31st are unaccounted for, and this is where we will begin our investigation. Now, let's consider our first suspect, Tsar Alexander III. Tsar Alexander III had been christened Tsar following the assassination of his father, the liberal reformer and freer of the serfs, Tsar Alexander II. As a result of his father's death, Tsar Alexander III became further entrenched in his already conservative and highly reactionary views of Russian society. Needless to say, this was not necessarily a man who would be tolerant of a well-known homosexual artist. And yet, it was known that due to Tchaikovsky's high achievements in the arts, the Tsar had guaranteed him a lifetime pension. So why would he suddenly order him killed? Well, as mentioned earlier, it all comes down to his sexuality. According to sources, a male attendant of Tchaikovsky's brother Modest, who was aristocratic by birth, caught Pyotr Ilyich's eye and an affair began. Now, either through Modest, the attendant's careless mouth, or perhaps another source, word got to the Tsar of this affair and the possibility that it might become public. This being the case, Tsar Alexander III ordered Tchaikovsky to take his own life via arsenic poisoning to preserve his honor, avoid the stigma of self-deletion, and spare the Russian public of an Oscar Wilde-style trial, revealing Tchaikovsky to be a homosexual. As the story goes, Tchaikovsky drank an unboiled glass of tap water to give himself a plausible alibi for contracting cholera, then quietly in Modest's apartment at night, poisoned himself with arsenic. In the following days, he specifically requested Modest delay the attending doctor until he was sure that he would not survive. And that is the theory of Tsar Alexander's involvement in Tchaikovsky's demise. But does it really add up? As mentioned before, Tsar Alexander III was hardly a tolerant man. But yet, from all primary sources regarding his relationship to Tchaikovsky, we know that 
despite his staunch Russian traditionalism, none of this hostility readily transferred onto Tchaikovsky himself, or really any of the Russian aristocracy. In fact, there is evidence to the contrary that the Tsar was aware of Tchaikovsky's homosexuality and for the most part paid it no mind, or tacitly understood it was to be expected in the arts. In fact, when Tchaikovsky died, Tsar Alexander III ordered a national mourning to take place, with the aforementioned citywide funeral procession in St. Petersburg taking place for Tchaikovsky with all expenses paid by the Tsardom. In addition, the only sources placing the Tsar at the center of Tchaikovsky's death are supposedly Alexander Glazunov, the Swiss musicologist Robert Alish Muser, age 17 at the time of Tchaikovsky's death, and Ricardo Drigo, Kapellmeister for the Imperial Russian court. And while these do seem to be relatively credible sources due to their proximity to both the inner workings of the Tsardom and Tchaikovsky himself, there is one glaring inconsistency. According to all sources involved, it was Glazunov, who was present the night Tchaikovsky took the fatal swig of water, who claimed that he knew all along it was the Tsar's doing, and as the story goes, he communicated that to a young Robert Alish Muzier, who shared it among a close series of confidants, before decades later was this story confirmed by a famous French musicologist. However, the glaring error here is for Alexander Glazunov to openly defy the Tsar and disclose, even to just a few people, the conspiracy to kill Tchaikovsky, this would have put himself and his family at considerable risk for very little gain, as Imperial Russia in the late 19th century was a tightly controlled authoritarian state with an active secret police that nary would have let the Tsar be implicated in the murder of a beloved Russian musical icon. And so, the idea that Alexander Glazunov would have been so loose with this information that it could have reached multiple people just seems near improbable approaching statistically zero likelihood. And coupling this again with the fact that the Tsar awarded Tchaikovsky with a funeral usually reserved for that of only the nobility and had been given only one other time to non-nobility, that being to the Russian poet Alexander Pushkin, given all of this, it seems that Tsar Alexander III can be ruled out as a suspect. Now on to the next suspect, Count Stenbock Fermor. Count Stenbock Fermor was a member of the Russian elite that ran in the same circles as Tchaikovsky, and they were familiar with one another on an acquaintance level. So how did he become a suspect in Tchaikovsky's death? Yet again, it comes back to the forbidden fruit of homosexuality. The story goes as follows. In a peak of excitement, Tchaikovsky took an eye to the young nephew of Count Fernbach Sturmor, and subsequently seduced him into a physical relationship. Upon hearing of this, the Count was enraged and insistent that the Tsar be informed of Tchaikovsky's corruption of his nephew, and ordered one Nikolai Jacobi, one of Tchaikovsky's peers from the Imperial School of Jurisprudence and a member of the aristocracy, to deliver the Tsar this message. However, not wanting to drag the Tsar into this affair, and also in an attempt to spare Russia itself a scandal of global proportions, Jacobi assembled a group of his and Tchaikovsky's peers from the Imperial School of Jurisprudence late at night and his study, supposedly on the night of October 31st, the one night that is unaccounted for in Tchaikovsky's schedule. Needless to say, this alleged gathering was a kangaroo court, and at the end of an excruciating five hours of interrogation and cross-examination, Tchaikovsky's peers unanimously came to the conclusion that he should end his own life discreetly, lest his dishonor and shame be known throughout the Russian Empire and the world. Tchaikovsky then allegedly left Jacobi's study in a fury, according to Jacobi's wife, and a few days later, the infamous water incident at the literary cafe happened, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, while this theory may seem similar to the previous one of Tsar Alexander ordering Tchaikovsky's death, it actually has far more evidence in its favor. The idea of these courts of honor, though thoroughly out of fashion in the West, were still prevalent in Russian society, and unlike the previous theory that involved a few evidentiary reaches regarding the Tsar's direct involvement in a murder, the idea of a court conspiracy in Imperial Russia to kill someone was not exactly uncommon. See, just a few decades later, the successful conspiracy that felled Grigory Rasputin. Now this whole account was relayed to Western biographers of Tchaikovsky in 1979 by Alexandra Orlova, a renowned Russian musicologist who defected from the Soviet Union. According to her, around 1913, an alumni of the Imperial School of Jurisprudence, Alexander Voitrov, had been gathering materials and documents to archive the history of the school. During his assemblage of this material, he took time to interview one Elizaveta Karlovna, who was the widow of the aforementioned Nikolai Jacobi, and the one who saw Tchaikovsky leaving that night, clearly flustered. 
It was during this series of interviews that Karlovna revealed that Tchaikovsky had revealed to her the exact events that took place on the night of October 31st, 1893. And in a 1993 documentary for the BBC presented by Anthony Holden, poison expert Dr. John Henry confirmed that the nature of Tchaikovsky's demise would accord with deliberate arsenic poisoning. So what to make of this theory? Well, while there are disputations, the ground they stand on is rather shaky. A few historians have noted that Count Stenbock Fermor was incorrectly identified as a duke. It doesn't amount to more than a misunderstanding of how to correctly translate certain Russian words. Additionally, historians have also pointed to the fact that at the Imperial School of Jurisprudence, being an all-male institution, homosexual encounters were not exactly uncommon among the young students. Therefore, Tchaikovsky's behavior would not have been considered abhorrent and this kangaroo court must be a myth. I, for one, have to disagree. It was one thing in the 19th century for teenage boys within the sheltered walls of aristocratic education to get up to a gay sexual affair or two, provided they were discreet and kept secret. It is quite another thing for an adult man in the highest echelons of Russian society to brazenly seduce the younger relative of another member of the elite, possibly exposing both, and the country at large, to scandal. And given that outside of Russian high society, Orthodox Christianity exerted a huge amount of influence in the populace, this scandal may have simply been too much for the wider Russian public to stomach. Now, the final piece of the puzzle. Would Tchaikovsky actually do something so reckless? Well, based on all accounts, including his own journal entries and testimonials of those who knew him, it's not so preposterous. As Tchaikovsky grew more comfortable with his own sexuality, he was known in fits of joy to pick up the odd male escort hanging around the slums of St. Petersburg. He was also known to lasciviously observe the Russian cadet corps training near his residence, stating the following. Petashenko used to drop by with the criminal intention of observing the cadet corps, which is right opposite our windows. But I've been trying to discourage these compromising visits, and with some success. Seducing a family member of another fellow elite does seem quite the bold and dangerous move, but keep in mind, by this point, Tchaikovsky was on a high known as one of the greatest composers not only in Russia, but all of Europe. It's not hard for one to see this series of events taking place and ultimately leading to Tchaikovsky's downfall. And now the final suspect, Tchaikovsky himself. Now, the final theory of Tchaikovsky's demise is by far the most controversial, that he was in incestuous love slash lust with his sister's son, Vladimir Bob Davidov. Now this, to put it lightly, is a highly charged accusation. Throughout the later years of his life, leading right up to the week of his death, Tchaikovsky began to depend on Bob daily for all sorts of tasks. Essentially, he became his personal assistant. And as this closeness grew, Tchaikovsky, with increasing frequency, began to record in his journals what many interpret as a growing romantic attraction to Bob. Now, despite this being the 19th century where first cousins were known to marry, the idea of not only homosexuality, but incestuous homosexuality, was a bridge of no return even for the most quote enlightened individuals in Russian society. Certainly Tchaikovsky himself knew this and his journal entries appear to illustrate to some his admission that he would never be able to fulfill his desire for Bob in this world. With this state of mind considered, the theory of Tchaikovsky's demise by his own hand becomes far more palatable and additionally, the reading of the Sixth Symphony as a Requiem, which was premiered a week before his end, becomes glaringly possible. And indeed, according to those present at its premiere, the Sixth Symphony seemed to be an autograph slash lithograph of a life lived, sometimes in triumph and sometimes in sorrow. The mournful dark opening movements signifying a stormy mind, the five four waltz of the second movement representing sensuous jubilation, the third movement depicting what appears to be a horse-mounted battle against Napoleon, perhaps a metaphor for Tchaikovsky's inner life, and finally, the finale's revisiting of mournful themes in a requiem-like style that ends, stunningly, in complete silence, a nearly unheard of way to end a major orchestral piece at the time. Mahler himself, in despair, would do a similar thing a few decades later. However, unlike the previous theories here, we have in fact a smoking gun. The dedicatee of the Sixth Symphony, the Pathétique, is none other than Bob Davidov. Now, certainly, it must have been apparent to Tchaikovsky that dedicating a symphony with such emotional depth to a younger man would, by all accounts, engender rumors of his personal life. In fact, this exact scenario had come up 20 years earlier when Tchaikovsky wanted to openly dedicate his now iconic violin concerto to Josef Kotick, his lover at the time. 
Anton Rubinstein forbade this in order to protect Tchaikovsky and the Moscow Conservatory from scandal. But make no mistake, Tchaikovsky had fought vigorously at first to dedicate the violin concerto to Josef Kotick. And while Tchaikovsky had eventually acquiesced to Anton Rubinstein's desires to blunt any speculation of his sexuality, by the time of the Pathétique, it seemed he no longer seemed to care. And why is that? Did Tchaikovsky know his end was near? and that it would be by his own hand? While one cannot be sure, the circumstantial evidence is compelling. So that's it, right? Oh, of course, sorry, there is one more theory, the official theory, that Tchaikovsky died of cholera. And while this may be the official narrative of his demise, it actually has the least amount of evidence, circumstantial or otherwise. Yes, there is the account of the meal at the literary cafe, and yes, there is Tchaikovsky experiencing some, though not all, of the symptoms of cholera. However, there is in fact quite a bit of evidence to go against the theory of cholera being the final culprit of Tchaikovsky's demise. The prime piece of evidence against this theory, the morning after Tchaikovsky's passing, in preparation for burial, multiple people, including famous composer Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, visited the apartment to pay their respects to Tchaikovsky. And it was noted by many, again including Rimsky-Korsakov, that the highly unusual nature of the whole setting. Medical opinion of the time stated deceased victims of cholera should be isolated from the community immediately in order to avoid possibly spreading the disease any further. And yet, Rimsky-Korsakov noted multiple people, including famous cellist and fellow professor at Moscow Conservatory, Alexander Vizbailovich, was sobbing for at least an hour repeatedly kissing Tchaikovsky's forehead, which again, according to medical guides of the day, was the exact opposite way a victim of cholera was to be treated in order to stop the spread. Rimsky-Korsakov in his private diaries noted again and again how odd this all was, considering the diagnosis of cholera. Now this all in retrospect would seem to imply to many, and Rimsky-Korsakov at the time, that the story story of the fatal swig of water and the subsequent infection was just not adding up. But what if it was cholera? Misdiagnoses are possible and diseases don't always present with all the symptoms. Well, one theory on how Tchaikovsky could have been diagnosed with cholera is that following the triumphant debut of the Sixth Symphony, Tchaikovsky had decided to treat himself to a male prostitute from the notorious slums of St. Petersburg. Now, as we mentioned earlier, this was something that Tchaikovsky was known to do, so it was not exactly an uncommon occurrence in his life. And due to the nature of how two men are intimate with each other, which I can't describe in detail on here due to terms of service, it is thought that it could be highly likely Tchaikovsky contracted cholera from this poor prostitute on the night of October 31st, again, the one night in his diary where his whereabouts are unaccounted for. Adding further weight to this, most male escorts in St. Petersburg were known to be desperately poor. And cholera being a disease of the poor, it's not a stretch to say that this escort could have been the vector of transfer to explain why a person of high society such as Tchaikovsky ultimately ended up suffering from a disease of the quote, poor and lower classes. And while both of these cholera theories appear to have some circumstantial evidence to them, though I would say the second one more than the first, it is possible that arsenic is still the culprit even if Tchaikovsky's life was ended by his own hand. It could have been, in a fit of despair, realizing he could never be with Bob, as we mentioned earlier, that he simply poisoned himself and the drink of unboiled water was again used as an alibi to explain a quote-unquote cholera infection. And so these are all of the theories meant to explain the mysterious death of Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky on that fateful week in November 1893. The only thing to talk about now is, of course, the Russian government's official response to this now century-and-a-half-long speculation. And that is exactly the problem. Each successive Russian government since Tchaikovsky's death, from Tsar Nicholas to the Soviets to now the Putin regime, all of them have refused to acknowledge the basic fact that he was incontrovertibly gay. And this makes it a little hard, because any additional journal entries referring to the composer's homosexuality, aside from the most famous ones in the West, have been suppressed. And because of this, we may be missing key details about that last week of his life that could explain exactly what happened on October 31st. And with that, this has been the story of the mysterious death of Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky. 